Hello everyone, welcome to this video on the Levi Civita connection, named after a French mathematician. Right now, this video deals with the idea of a connection on a manifold. It looks at the Levi Civita connection and runs through a mathematical argument that derives the form it takes for the pseudo Riemannian manifold of space time. Finally, it looks at how this connection is different from that of an affine connection. All right. Um, am I going to be in the way there? Just hide that. All right. So in differential geometry and general relativity, the concept of a connection is fundamental to understanding how to differentiate vector fields on a curved manifold. Um, an affine connection, or just connection, is a smooth manifold on a smooth manifold, sorry, provides a way to differentiate vector fields in a manner that generalizes the usual derivative from Euclidean space to curved spaces. It defines a covariant derivative that allows you to compare vectors at different points on the manifold. Now, mathematically, an affine connection is a rule that assigns to any pair of vector fields X and Y a new vector field, del XY, nabla XY, called the covariant derivative of Y with respect to X. So the covariant derivative of the vector field Y with respect to the vector field X. It extends the idea of directional derivatives from vector calculus to the context of curved spaces, manifolds. All right, so this assignment must satisfy certain linearity and product rule, Leibniz rule conditions. We'll see that um, later in this video. And the affine connection is usually represented by the Christoffel symbols, one index up, two down, two indices down, one index contravariant, two indices covariant, which determine how the components of a vector field change as you move along the manifold. <clears throat> Why is that necessary? Well, we'll look at some diagrams shortly. So unlike flat Euclidean space, and we'll look at a diagram of that shortly, a manifold can be curved. This curvature means that the rules for parallel transporting vectors, moving vectors along curves without changing their direction, are not trivial. And I'll try and indicate that with the diagrams coming shortly. So on a curved manifold, moving a vector parallel to itself along a closed loop generally does not return the vector to its original orientation. This is a manifestation of curvature. And one of my videos looks at that um, parallel transporting vectors around and it uses a surface, a two-sphere surface for, for that purpose. So in a local coordinate system then, if I, um, our, the covariant derivative of the vector field y in the direction of the vector field x in components is x mu del mu y and then expanding y in terms of its components y nu d nu. Notice this d nu is the differential operator representing the basis vectors. Uh, and so here's the form in component form. All right. All right, let's move on. All right, so flat space, if you notice the basis vectors are the same everywhere. The entire space <clears throat> is one whole vector space. It is one vector space. The basis vectors in the x direction and this R2 here, uh, the basis vectors in the x direction are all constant. The basis vectors in the y direction are all constant, everywhere constant. You can compare vectors at different points. You can compare the change between them by subtracting them, final vector minus initial vector. So you've got a vector this way here and a vector this way here. Then the change is just this vector minus that vector. All right, now in flat, <clears throat> maybe I've got here. So in flat space, the basis vectors are constant from point to point. So um, the partial derivative of the basis vectors with respect to the coordinates, x or y, is zero. And the derivative of a vector in flat space is simply the partial derivatives of the components of the vector and not the basis vector. All right. So that's calculus in Euclidean uh, spaces. All right. But on curved spaces, whoops, I'm in the way there. On curved space, uh, in curved space, the basis vectors vary from point to point, and each point on the manifold has its own tangent space. And the, the basis vectors and any other vectors at that point belong in that tangent space. Separate tangents, so every point on the manifold has its own separate tangent space. The basis vectors change from point to point. We can't simply on a manifold add or subtract vectors. There's no such sensible operation. If we want, wish to compare vectors, 
then what we need to do is take a vector at one point, say point C, and parallel transport it back to point B along some curve or, or some other means, right? But we need to parallel transport it back before we can compare the change in them. All right. So that means the derivative of a vector involves both a change in its components as well as a change in its basis vectors because the basis vectors are everywhere different on the manifold. Each tangent space to each point of the manifold has its own basis vectors. So in general then, so we have some vector V, uh, the partial derivative of that is the partial derivative of the components times the basis vector plus the components times the partial derivative of the basis vectors themselves, different to Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, this second part is zero. All right. So if a covariate basis vector E alpha, then the uh, change in that, I'm just going to quote this formula, and then later on we'll see why, which is the point of this video. Why is it this form? Why does it take this form? And that's what I, that's what I want to go through shortly. But anyway, for the moment, partial derivative of the basis vectors is this. Christoffel symbol of the second kind here, expanded E gamma, or in these component forms here, uh, vectors for physicists and then differential operators for the differential geometers. But del mu d nu, partial nu, I should say, is this uh, uh, is equal to the Christoffel symbol of the third kind, expanded with the partial multiplied by the partial basis in the component lambda. For a contravariate basis vector, Okay, uh, or otherwise a one form, you have the minus here. All right, so that means now moving that now the partial derivative of our vector again is this object here. And we're now the partial derivative of the basis vector now gives us this object here, which is if you have a look here, well, this expression here would have been here. This derivative of the, of the basis vectors would have been here. It's equal to this, so we put that there. And then uh, just one more step as we can write it in terms of common basis vectors, both terms. See the gamma there and the alpha. Uh, dummy indices, they can be swapped. So we can have gamma here, gamma here, and alpha here, alpha here. And then we have the common basis vector. So here's the derivative of our vector in terms of the derivative of the components and the derivative of the basis vectors combined in a common basis vector. All right, so <clears throat> now the Levi, I hope that's readable if I just do that there. All right, the levi Civita connection is an essential tool in differential geometry and general relativity, providing a means to differentiate vector fields on curved manifolds while preserving their geometric properties. So this is now the levi Civita connection and we're going to, for the rest of the video, follow that argument. How, what form does it take is what I'm trying to get at. So it's essential for defining how vectors change as they are transported along curves in a manifold. And the levi civita connection is unique because it satisfies two important properties. Let me move that out of there. <clears throat> um, number one, property number one is metric compatibility. So the levi civita connection preserves the inner product defined by the metric tensor. So mathematically, this means that the covariant derivative of the metric tensor G with respect to this connection is zero. So del G, nabla G equals zero. All right, so it preserves the inner product. So angles and magnitudes of vectors are held constant under this connection. All right, so again, in the way, I'm going to remove that for the moment. So in other words, the length of vectors and the angles between them are preserved under parallel transport, which is very important. Think about it. If you've got vectors of two different points on the manifold and you want to compare the change, then you take the second vector, the final vector, and you parallel transport it back, but you want to keep it parallel to itself, same length, so that when you bring it back to the other vector, transport it back to the other vector, when you look for the change, you can see what the change is. You don't want the final vector one being parallel transported back, you don't want it altered as it's transported back to be compared with the first vector. The other condition is torsion free, another important condition. So the levi civita connection has no torsion, which means that the torsion tensor is zero. Now the torsion ten tensor sorry, measures the failure of the connection to be symmetric in its lower indices. So the torsion tensor has this form here, the two vector fields x, y. What does that mean? This implies the connection does not produce any twisting 
as vectors are parallel transported. This means that the connection coefficients, Christoffel symbols, are symmetric in the lower two indices. So our Christoffel symbol of the third kind, uh, of the second kind, sorry, um, lambda mu nu. Okay, notice that the two lower indices can be swapped in a torsion-less, torsion-free manifold. All right, so what does the levi Savita connection do? Let's move on. All right, <clears throat> so the levi Savita connection provides a way to transport vectors along curves in a manner that preserves their length and direction relative to the manifold's geometry. This process is known as parallel transport. So when a vector is parallel transported along a curve, it remains parallel in the sense that its covariant derivative along the curve is zero. So for a vector field V, um, along a curve gamma of t, parallel transport satisfies the total derivative d in these are the components in d v mu dt is d v mu dt plus the um, the second time uh, kind Christopher symbol is the second kind uh, time the component v mu dx d sigma dt all right equals zero. Now. Um, Okay, geodesics. Now, in curves that parallel transport their own tangent vector, in other words, they are straight lines of curved spaces, the geodesic equation has this form. So that's curves. Uh, geodesics are curves that parallel transport their own uh, tangent vector, and that tangent vector has components um, dx mu dt, all right? In other words, they are straight lines of curve, they're so called straight lines of curved spaces, so to speak. All right, and then the geodesic equation is this form, and this describes the path of freely falling particles in general relativity. All right, All right. okay, next one. Sorry about that jumpy hand, if you like. All right, now the Riemann curvature tensor, which measures the curvature of the manifold, is defined using the Levi Savita connection in here. Okay, you notice here the derivatives of the Levi Savita connection and products of them. Now this tensor encodes how much the manifold deviates from being flat. Now in the context of general relativity, another application is the levi savita connection is used to define the Einstein field equations, which relate the curvature of space-time to the energy and momentum of matter. Here, uh, here's the Einstein um, field equations here. Uh, R mu nu, the Ricci curvature scalar, a tensor, sorry. R is the Ricci scalar and T mu nu is the stress energy tensor. Now, given the two equation, conditions sorry, above, what form does this connection take? So given metric compatibility and torsion-free or torsionless, all right, given those two conditions, what form is this connection going to take? And that's the major part of this video. All right. So a useful expression, uh, just as a preliminary, a useful expression is, a useful expression will be for us is x dot g of y, z. So we've got three vector fields, x, y, and z. Now this represents the directional derivative of the scalar field g, y, z, because this is the metric the, um, uh, uh, under the vector fields y and z. Um, uh, oh, I've forgotten the word now. Uh, but the, the actual action of the metric on the vector fields y and z, the contraction of the two vectors y and z under the metric g. All right, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, um, now this represents the directional derivative of the scalar field, because this is a scalar once you've contracted the two vectors, um, in the direction of x. All right, so if I, so in local coordinates, x is this, x alpha, d alpha, partial alpha, y is y beta, partial beta, z is z delta, partial uh, delta, uh, and x dot g of y, z in component form is x alpha, d alpha, and then all of this here. So, um, and just uh, point out to g beta delta is just partial b dotted or multiplied with partial uh, delta. All right, this is the basis vector that gives us g beta. So there's three things in here. We have a product of three things. We have the metric itself composed of the you know, product of the basis vectors, and we have um, y and z components. So this uh, partial operator here is going to act on each of three of these using the product rule, which we mentioned earlier. Remember that condition there? It's also a condition of linearity, um, uh, but we're concerned now we're going to use the product rule here. And that will look like 
this. Can I fit that somewhere? Blimey. Maybe I need to hide that. All right, so it turns out the following expression will help us, x dot g of y, z. So that's the um, directional derivative of x of the um, scalar function in the direction of x. So let x, y, z be vector fields. We want to differentiate the inner product. Um, this here, because remember this is an inner product, it's y and z under the, the action of the metric. I'll, talk, I'll show you that in a minute. Along x, now this is de denoted x dot g of y, z and represents the directional derivative of the scalar field g, y, z in the direction of x. So using the product rule for differentiation, okay, because remember it's a, a partial operator in here. See down here, here's our partial operator here, and it's going to act on the product of these three things. All right, this component, this component, and this metric here. Okay, so we get partial alpha acting on the first on the metric, multiplied by the two components, plus then the metric uh, outside, the metric part outside, the metric term outside, and then the partial acting on the y vector field beta component, and then or all the components I should say, and then those two product together, and then finally the partial acting on the z component. So, right, so the product rule there applies. Now here, um, so you, the product rule gives us this object here, if we express it back in vector form. Uh, in a local coordinate system, it's going to look like this. Once you have a local coordinate system, you're then going to be in, all the components will look like this. But in general, here's our form, x dot g of y, z, is the um, operator covariant derivative of g in the direction of x, acting on y, z. Okay, so here del x del x g of y z denotes the covariant derivative of the metric tensor applied then to the vectors y and z, and then we have the uh, metric tensor applied to this new vector and that original vector, and then the metric tensor plus the metric tensor applied to the y vector and this new vector here, which is a covariant derivative of z in the direction of x. All right. And again, in the local coordinate system, it looks like this. Let's move on. All right, now, can I? Ah, oh, wherever I go, I'm going to be in the way here. Just move that. All right, so by the metric compatibility condition, the covariant derivative of the metric tensor is zero. So that first term there in that three part on the right-hand side in the previous slide is zero. So that drops out. So that leaves us now with x dot x, the um, directional derivative of this scalar in the direction of x, or the derivative of this scalar in the direction of x, leaves us just these two terms here. It's the metric acting on this vector and z, and the metric acting on the y vector and this new vector here, whereas this is the covariant derivative of the vector field y in the direction of x. Now, in local coordinates, if x is d alpha and y is uh, partial beta, sorry, not d, partial beta, and z is partial gamma. This can be written as partial alpha of the metric is equal to this. Okay. All right. This one here, that's the partial derivative of d beta. That's the y here. Okay. In the direction of partial alpha. And then the metric acts on that new vector here and this vector partial gamma. And then we have the metric acting on these two vectors, which is partial beta and the um, derivative, covariant derivative of partial gamma in the direction of partial alpha. All right. So the covariant derivatives of the basis vectors can be written, just remind you again, in terms of Christoffel symbols as, so this one here could be written as this capital gamma, delta alpha beta partial delta expand like that. So this term here could be replaced with that. And then a similar one for here as well. And that's what we'll do on the next slide. All right. All right. Look at that. I can fit in there. All right. Now, so substituting this, we get, remember here, this, this has been replaced now with the um, Christoffel symbols, the second kind. Uh, and notice here, this partial delta and partial gamma gives us the metric here. The inner product of those gives us the metric here. Inner product of those gives us this metric delta gamma. And this one, partial beta, partial delta, gives us 
the inner product of those gives us this metric term here. And then of course the Christoffel symbols are the scalar quantities that are multiplying by these metrics. Uh, they're just a scalar quantity that's multiplied. So partial beta dot and partial delta gives us G beta delta. Now, if we cycle through permutations of the indices, alpha, beta, and gamma, we can write the following equations. Sliding through those. Now, we're going to make use of that second property, and that's the torsion-free nature of the parameters we're talking of the manifold we're talking about here. So in the case of a torsion-free manifold, we can make the following sum, and you'll see why that is in a minute. So I can take this one plus this one, and then I can minus this one. All right, and you'll see why shortly, um, because what that does then is that gives us these two terms here, then it gives plus these two terms there, then minus these here. Now what will happen here, and again, it's the torsion-free capacity, but because um, this is a torsion-free manifold, we can swap the two indices down here, beta and gamma, can be swapped, so we get gamma beta. And then this symbol here is equal to this symbol here, only in a torsion-free manifold or torsion-less manifold. Um, again, with that same symmetry, we have then that G delta alpha is G alpha delta. All right, they can be swapped as well. All right. Um, and certainly partial derivatives commute anyway at each point. So in the local coordinate system at each point, they will. And what will happen then, and what will happen then is that this and this are the same term separated by a minus. So they're going to cancel. And the same thing happened with this one and this one. And they will cancel. And then we'll be left with two terms. So let's go over the page now. All right, uh, move that down a bit. And so we notice that this sum we've just formed is this and this again. I'm just repeating from the previous slide. And then just reiterating that point again, if I just pick this term and this term, then we notice that this term here minus this one, well, they're really the same thing because in the second one here, we can swap the beta and the gamma. So gamma beta becomes beta gamma, and the same thing, and alpha delta becomes delta alpha. And then you can see that this and this are the same, so they cancel out to zero. Now the torsion-free property means the first Christoffel symbol appears twice on the right side, and the others can be cancelled out. Uh, the first Chris, so here, the, these two here, we're going to do the same thing, swap those in about, and we end up with two times gamma delta alpha beta, so just two times this, because this is the same as this, we get a two here, g delta gamma, all right, uh, and then what that means is we can rewrite that as this um, Christoffel symbol times the metric term here is a half times that. All right, now multiply both sides by the inverse of this metric, so use g gamma epsilon to isolate uh, the Christoffel symbol, this one. And so when we multiply through, we get both sides multiplying, and then let me just go over the page. Okay, so this one can be rewritten as, I'll just take this uh, scalar here and put it in front there. You can see it more clearly. And now the Kronecker delta applies, gamma up, gamma down, epsilon delta, epsilon delta. Okay, so when epsilon is equal to delta, delta is equal to epsilon, okay, we end up with this. Otherwise, elsewhere it's zero. So we get now, we've summed out the delta, we're left with epsilon, alpha, beta. So here's our Christoffel symbol for a uh, for a manifold that has the levi Savita connection. And so the form of our levi Savita connection is this, because we have a torsion-less manifold and we have metric compatibility. Those two conditions then give us a Christoffel symbol of this form. All right. So in the context, let me move that up. In the context of general relativity, the levi Savita connection is used because it ensures that the covariant derivative is compatible with the space-time metric, observing distances and angles, that is, and does not introduce any torsion. So the geodesic equation, which describes the paths of freely falling of free falling particles, is defined using the levi Savita connection. I showed you that earlier on. Now the affine connection is a general concept providing a way to differentiate vector fields. Now let's compare 
the levi Savita connection with the affine connection. They're not exactly the same thing. So the affine connection is a general concept providing a way to differentiate vector fields on a manifold. Whoops. Okay, the levi Savita connection is a special type of affine connection that is both metric compatible and torsion free. You've seen what that results in. This is how we get this form of the Christoffel symbol right, as our levi Savita connection for our manifold. So while all levi Savita connections are affine connections, not all affine connections are levi Savita connections. So just be aware of that. And that's the difference between the two. All right, I hope that helps. I hope that you find that useful and I hope uh, I've made myself clear in the video. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please hit the like button below if you can, please. And um, I'll see you in the next video. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye.